Hello, I'm Laura Furiosi, divorced mother of three, and I'm here with my mother, Lynette Galvin, with 35 years' experience in family law. You're listening to the Divorce Course Podcast. Through our candid discussions, we hope to help you through your divorce or de facto separation. We will be answering the most commonly asked questions and covering the stages and steps that you will face on your way to freedom. Hello, and welcome to the Divorce Course Podcast. Welcome back, Mum. Hello, Laura. Hello, everyone. And I want to thank you again, Mum, for your time. Today we are basing our episode around a couple of emails that we've received recently. And so we're talking about basically the law and children and parenting. So what to expect is decided in the courts, how it's decided. And I think the first... Uh, And then we're going to actually cover some specific questions sent in by some of our listeners to help maybe alleviate some worry and clarify some things. But let's Hmm. try and cover it for everyone. And let's start talking about what's the law on children, basically, with parenting? What what? With the, with the specific section of the Act. All right. So the family courts, that's the Federal Circuit Court currently and the family law courts and whatever they combine to be, they've got the power to make orders about children as a result of a breakdown of a de facto or a marriage, a de facto relationship or a marriage. Um, and that the relevant part of the Family Law Act is in Section 60 of the Family Law Act, and, and we'll put some links below, won't we, Laura? Um, And basically the objects of the Act are to give the children the right to grow up, to be, I guess, the best version of themselves and to be loved and cared for by both parents and have a relationship with both parents. But also, uh, on the other hand, to protect them from psychological, uh, emotional or physical harm. Um, And if having a relationship with one of the parents is going to, in the eyes of the court, cause um, emotional, physical um, or psychological harm, uh, then the court is to give uh, more weight to saving the child from that harm than they should give to the child having to see a parent who's causing that harm. Hmm. So, so the court... Right, right. so that's, yeah. that's in the section of the, of the Act. Section right? 60, yep. Yeah. It's just the like a roadmap for the judges because when you go before a judge in the court, they don't know either of you. Uh, they don't know your kids, so um, it's just someone you don't know, um, and they have been given this roadmap by the government in the Family Law Act as to how they're to decide about your kids. So if you go into Section 60CC, it's headed very helpfully how a court determines what is in the child's best interests, um, and it talks about those uh, major issues, primary considerations, the relationship and saving the children from harm. And now the less important things um, are set out in, in 60CC3 and it talks about any views expressed by the child. Um, but, of course, if it's an older child, they'll get given more weight um, than a young child. Uh, can and- I ask, just can, can yeah. I just stop there? Yeah. Um, I do. I get a lot of questions from um, parents online through the Instagram and the Facebook mm. and they, they they want to know, do, do, do children get to have a say, do they get to go up and, and, and sit in court and tell a judge how they feel or or if if you don't go to court and you're just trying to get an agreement between yourselves, is there a lot of weight put on what, it, say, a, a six-year-old or a seven-year-old child, for example, wants, okay. or is it is there not that much weight put on? Oh, it's a that's a really big question, and whole trials are held on that point, Laura. But the the children don't go into the court. Um, the court feels uh, that it's no place for kids, and it catches them too much up in the conflict. Um, it also exposes the kids to manipulation by one or other of the parents. And if they were to go to court and talk to a judge, and, you know, 40 years ago they did, they used to go and talk to a judge in chambers. Um, I've only heard of one case in the last three years where that's happened. But those judges aren't trained to identify if a kid's being coached by a parent. So now the way the court finds out what the children's wishes are uh, is either through a family report um, where the kids and the parents go and see a social worker or a psychologist um, and the kids are gently 
um, probed to see what their views are. So, so the other question is, are they gently probed to see what their views are on what day pickup is or on whether they want half Christmases or whether mm. they want to, you know, what, what, kind of, what kind of information does the court take into consideration about children's wishes? Is it the specifics? Do they sit down in family reports and ask some specifics or is it just the um, general like, like, gist of it? The family report only goes for a day, usually a full family report. Um, and the, the report writer's questions are usually guided by two things. One, what is in the affidavit um, by each party, very much you filed your material by then, so they, they they get to read all the court documents. That's one quick thing, and that might give them mm. some tips of things to ask because their primary role is to assist the court in making a decision. So first of all, they have to look at the applications by either parties and see what it is what it is that the court is being asked to decide, and then the uh, uh, family report writer will. Um, try to get that information from the children without uh, being too blunt about it. They usually um, won't say things like, well, do you want to live with mum or dad? Um, They do things uh, Mm. more subtly than that and ask the kids perhaps if they had three wishes, what would that be, et cetera. Okay. All right. So so basically, so basically, just to cover that off, that the kids aren't ever dragged into court, it's only rarely ever that happens, and it's only about trying to get an, a basic understanding of how the kids are and, and how the family's going. So the children's wishes are taken into account but through a family report usually. Yep, or, or through uh, perhaps a conciliation conference, the kids, you can express the kids' views or, or family counselling, maybe the children get to express their views there. Yep. Okay. All right. So that was one of the things in the thing. Um, so obviously the two main things that law really is on is that the children's right to have a relationship with both parents and to keep them safe yes. from harm. Those two main ones. And then you said the smaller ones, one of them is the children's views. Are there any other smaller parts yep. that are taken into account? Yeah. Okay. So the next one is they just explore the relationship of the children, each of the children with their parents and also any other parents like a, a relative of the child. Um, and then that's that's the second thing they take into account as an additional consideration. And then they, the next one is the extent to which the parents have taken the opportunity to be involved with the child, to spend time with the child and communicate with the child. And these are times, for instance, if someone's been completely absent for five years or two years of the kid's life, then the court has a look at that when they're working out what, what's right for the child going forward. And also they look at child support, the extent to which a child's parents has paid their child support. Um, and then the next one is what would happen, what's the effect of any changes if the child, uh, for instance, was to be separated from one or other of his parents or from any other child including a relative with whom he or she's been living, okay? Um, then the, right. So that's yeah. um, so I'm, I'm going through them. So it's the nature of the relationship. So first of all is the views of the child, B is the nice nature of the relationship, and then the extent people have been involved in their child's lives, the extent to which they've paid child support um, and the effect on the child. Um, and then uh, they do look at, the practical difficulty and expense, it says, of a child spending time with both parents. So if people live a long way away, um, you can't do usually a 50-50 shared care arrangement. It's just not practical. child's got to go to school. You know, if you live three hours drive away, um, then I think you're looking at holidays and time for the children. Uh, then they look at, um, they look at, gee, this one is not that, um, commonly dealt with, but they look at the maturity um, and sex and lifestyle and background of the child, including their cultural background, and each of the parents and any other characteristics of the child the court thinks are relevant. So that's kind of every player wins a prize and the judge can sometimes those things become very important in a case. Sometimes that's never even mentioned. Um, there's specific provisions okay. for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children for them to um, to get to know their culture. Uh, yeah. Um, mm. Shall I okay. keep going? All right. So, so base. 
No, that's it. so I think we'll put that list, um, yeah. that section of the act from Osley in the show notes for people to have a look and understand. But like you said, the mm. main two things that a court looks at is the right for a, a child to have a relationship with both parents and uh, the right for the child to live and be safe. Yes. And then that's that balancing act. And then all of those other things t- uh, taken into consideration, but at a, 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 a lighter weight. They, and um, they are how the court, with parenting. Oh, sorry. Those things give the judge yeah. the, like a tick box they've got to look at in deciding best interests of the child. Yeah. Yeah. So the judge isn't just making the decision based on whether they like the look of you. They're making the decisions based on these laws. Um, the thing is, if you are listening to this, um, you know, you can come to your agreement yourselves mm. uh, without a court involvement because you can come up with your parenting agreement, your parenting plan. You can draw up your agreement you can get it filed in the court as consent orders. You do it together mm. and then you have that agreement. Um, you don't need the court's involvement. The court will check it if you file it, won't, won't they, Mum, to make sure it's fair. But mm. um, if you do not get to an agreement and you've tried mediation, which you can see our um, other podcasts for or you can listen to or you can do the module of mediation in the divorce course, um, you, you you really need to be covering those 12 agreements that we've discussed in another episode, which I'll link down below, mm-hmm. but that's um, long-term parental responsibility, day-to-day parental responsibility, what days your child lives with you in term time, what days your child lives with the other parent in term time, how your child spends holidays, changeovers, what your child is doing on Christmas, what your child does on Easter, what... Uh, does happen on birthdays, how you have phone communication with the um, the child when you're not with the child and how do you exchange information with the other parent and also how to make sure you keep that uh, respect and not talking about adult matters mm. around the children. Now, those if you can get those agreements, you don't need to rely on the court to come up with those decisions. If you have a vague idea of what the, the law would be and looking at the law and maybe seeing a law and knowing where you stand or doing the divorce course the do it, do it, do it yourself uh, blueprint. You can kind of get a basic understanding of that, and you can can go through mediation or do it yourself and come up with your agreement. But if you can't, and I know there's a lot of people that can't, Mum, mm. that write into us, mm. uh, and they have you know lots of questions. So, and we've already talked about the family report. That's a way that the children's wishes, wishes can be expressed. Mm. How else does the does the court find out? that information that they've got to tick their boxes off. So how else does the court find out this information? Okay. So the court itself doesn't make any inquiries. They rely on the parties <clears throat> to give the evidence to them. Okay. So uh, they, a party, like if you're mum and you've got an allegation about um dad being violent, maybe you issue a subpoena so that evidence gets before the court. If your um, dad and uh, you um, know that the children haven't been attending school regularly, uh, then you might subpoena the schools or school records to bring that evidence to the judge. Sometimes uh, the court says this is complex, um, uh, we need an independent children's lawyer and that independent children's lawyer undertakes all of those inquiries for the court um, and and even forms a view about what should happen and their role is to assist the judge in making a decision. Uh, the family report, whilst it, it is a way for the children's wishes to be expressed, um, is also sometimes useful in the judge for the judge because the those family report writers may pick up on one parent or another parent's um, attitude that is perhaps um, making it more difficult for the children. So, um, yeah, so all of that gets gathered up. Medical records can be subpoenaed. Um, if you think one or other of the parties um, has a, a mental health issue, uh, there might need to be a psychiatric report if an allegation is around that someone's taking dr- drugs. So if you're a judge and one person says the other parent takes drugs and the other parent says, no, I don't, what what does a judge do with that? He doesn't or she doesn't know these people. So they get uh, someone has to order a, a drug test 
um, probably a hair test to see if if there's any truth in that allegation. So it's a hard job. Mm. Affidavits, I guess, so, and that's as the well. same for. Mm. So you so you can't just go to a judge and just say, well, this is the reason why. Mm. <laughs> you need to you need to have a reason. You, you put it in an affidavit. Mm. Yeah. And, and I think one of the questions that I get asked a lot is, can my child be taken off me 100%? Honestly, I can't remember a time um, in my 35 years where a child didn't have at least um, letters and cards perhaps. Um, the only time that, and the only time I've seen that is where someone's popped back into a child's life after seven or eight years and the child doesn't want to know them. So now that we've ta- told you about the Family Law Act, it would be um, very ha- hard for a court to make an order that didn't give uh, a child time with each of the parents. Do you know, there would have to be something mm. really um Dreadful. I used to say um, <laughs> only if you're an, ac- an axe murderer, maybe, um, and it's almost to that level. Yeah. So if if someone's threatening to take the children off you 100%, um, don't worry about that, uh, particularly if they've been with you uh, because the court's going to look at the effect on the kids of being moved. Remember those issues we were talking about that the court takes into account? Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, that's just really, that's just a threat usually and um, please don't worry about it mm. is that usually something that a high controlling maybe a manipulative person might do if they're trying to scare you into Too right. making an agreement maybe yeah particularly if they've had the upper hand throughout the relationship um that's they know um if the children like it's very hard for men um, too if they've had their children taken off them and they're not allowed to see them until they get to court and get an order. Um, but, yes, it, it's really just a controlling mm. thing. If you're, uh, as someone has written in and is a little bit worried about that situation and we've had more than one person write in about that, oh. um, the likelihood of that happening based on what the the court as legislation's written on it, it's it's highly unlikely that can occur. And and does the court looks at the past, how how the how the children have been going in the past, how their their current arrangements are. Yeah. Um, they're not going to sway too far from that unless there's a drastic reason why. Exactly they right. Should. Yep. An axe murderer level event. I think. <laughs> If you are a parent who is stressing about this, and as you know, you know, we're in COVID at the moment uh, still, you know, stress can affect you and this kind of stress of worrying about losing your children can really affect you and you've got to just uh, sit down and, and, and maybe read read the legislation and remind yourself it's highly unlikely unless you are an axe murderer, you're mm-hmm. going to be okay, you're going to see your children. What about one of the questions we did get asked was siblings. Oh, yes. If they're asking for one child to be separated from the others, what's the court's yeah. view on so, that? So if you've got, say, four kids or, or something and, and the other person just wants one of the kids to live with them most of the time, mm. um, the court is not keen on separating siblings. So usually where there's a suggestion that the kids are going to be split up like that, um, the court would order a family mm. report. Uh, what the, what worries the court is that if if say one or two kids go to live with one parent and two kids with another parent, well those children if they're spending weekends say with the other swapping over they never get time together. So the court is really more worried in some ways about preserving their relationship with each other than they are with the parents. Mm. So it's very unusual to separate siblings. Um, the only difference, some, sometimes a court would look at it if uh, perhaps there's very strong views expressed by a much older child um, or if um, in the early days where it's essentially two families where, for instance, the parties may have had two kids um you know, 15 years ago, 13 years ago, and then they've just had an, had another baby or two children and then they split up. So they might think then, but um, the courts are very aware of the importance of sibling relationships in the children growing up to be the best version of themselves. So, yes, very well, I guess rare. that's the main aim really for, for the main aim for parents 
end for the court, I guess, is for the children to have the best life. Yep. And that, so that's something to keep in mind when you're negotiating. If you haven't gotten to court yet, you know, do you want your children to have to go through this system? Do you want your children to be interviewed by a court family report writer? Um, is there something that you could maybe compromise on to help so yep. that you're not putting everybody through it, but making sure that you are doing what's in the best interest of the children? Um, one other question we've been asked by someone is, uh, there's been a mediation organised um, by the, the 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 parent, the other parent, um, and they're saying that if you don't give in to all my demands, that means I can take you to court. So, so what? What mm-hmm. is that? Is that a threat? Is that is that something uh, that's real? Sounds like a, a bully, bully, bullying to me, uh, because the person who decides uh, whether to give a certificate so that you can go to court, because remembering mediation's compulsory before you can file in the court for court proceedings. Well, the person, you have to provide a certificate from a mediator, so the mediator has the power in that circumstance. So the the mediator might think that there's still more negotiation to happen um, and they might not issue their 60, 60i certificate. They might say, come back. Or they might say um, that neither of you or that one person, the one who says you've got to agree to everything or I'm out, um, that person really hasn't made a genuine attempt to me- to mediate and the, and the mediator may again refuse to give that certificate to them. Uh, so it's not in the power of that person. It's only in the power of the mediator. And you don't go into any mediation with an all or nothing approach because you will never settle anything unless parties compromise. I was just thinking there there are some people that you just don't want to end up in court with because it's going to be a huge, long, drawn-out drain on your kids and you want them to reach their full potential. So uh, sometimes if they're adamant, you can drop the rope and, and just let them win it if it's not that important. If it's not that bad, like mm. I guess if they're saying you need to give me full custody of the Ooh. children or I'm going to. No. We'll uh, s- and you have to agree in mediation or I'm taking you to court. Obviously, you're not going to give me no. that. And you go to court and then you know what the court uh, has their their view on that mm-hmm. and their, their legislation they need to rely on. And it, that doesn't support that in any way unless you are like mum says, an axe murderer. So <laughs> and I doubt any any of our listeners are axe murderers. If you are, stop listening now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, any axe murderers are banned once yeah. we can figure out how you are banned officially. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I guess that might help alleviate that person's question a little bit. Mm. Um, there was one other question and that was FDRs. What are FDRs? Well, uh, FDR is short for a family dispute resolution which is just a mediation about children so a um okay lots of people are mediators and can mediate property matters but the only a person with specific qualifications is allowed to mediate matters relating to children so uh, fdr right. family dispute resolution and it's so what we were talking about just before where you get a 60 i certificate mm. that's family dispute resolution yeah and, and i want to just say to people if, if you come out of the mediation if you come out of the mediation and there hasn't been any success and you have to go to court it's not the end of the world because at every stage along the way you can still be negotiating you know, um, they may go and see a lawyer That's right. who says, look, what you're wanting is unreasonable, you know, and, and you might be able to agree just a, a two weeks later or a month later. So it's always a moving opportunity mm-hmm. to negotiate. Well, I, I guess that is the case. Like uh, one of the questions was, do people use FDRs as a ticket to, of stepping stones to court? And I mm. guess, yes, they get that certificate at the end saying you've tried mediation, it hasn't worked. But like mum's mentioned in most podcasts, the potent, the opportunity to negotiate is always available. Yep. The opportunity to agree is always there. And like you've said, Mum, you've had many cases that have gone all the way to trial and the, it just five minutes before you're meant to walk through into the, ju- the judge room, everyone's come to an agreement. So yep. don't think that it just goes straight from mediation or FDR to a trial. Yep. Uh, there's a lot in between. And 
and usually someone will be speaking reason to both of you and both of you yeah that's right yes so so court's not a dirty word to that person who's worried if he says that um if you don't agree to everything i'm going to court well that's just a continuation of the opportunity to negotiate yeah so i guess it's really important for everyone to understand that when it comes to children in the law it's not about the parents um Mm. unless you've done something bad Mm -hmm. uh it's really about the children and what's in the best interest of them and it might you know everybody wants to have their children with them all the time like we all want to have our babies with us all the time but you know our, our babies also have another parent that's how we make babies so of course they're going to they're, they're going to need to see their the other side for the benefit of them growing up and and learning about themselves and 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 learning from two different people and I guess that's you know how the family court sees it as important and it and it is mm. so it's important that if you can try to create your parenting agreement through either negotiating with each other via email by phone by text or by a mediator um, if you can get those 12 agreements which we I'll put a link to the episode that we do the 12 parenting agreements if you can lock them in you're not going to need to go to court mm. We do in the divorce course take you through each step. We help you write the clauses. We give you the different clauses you can choose from and we have letter templates on how to negotiate that and I think that would be helpful for those people that do want to stay out of court and look, uh, I I think that's as mum always recommends, it's best to stay out of court unless you're really at loggerheads and can't come to an Mm. agreement. When it when it comes to the best interests of the children, you've just got to maybe take that step back and have a look at the bigger picture. And and kids are only kids for a short amount of time, aren't they, Mum? I mean, they get to what sixteen, seventeen, well, and then fifteen. They don't want to see either parent. If, if, if it's too <laughs> they, toxic, they want to take the car keys yeah. and go. If it's too toxic, that's right. Yeah. And and say a child only remembers from the age of three on. There's twelve years now. Court at the moment, and I'm hoping and praying that uh, the Chief Justice can get the wait times down. But you could be two to three years between first starting court and finally getting a judgment. So my word, um, that's a big chunk. That's a quarter of their childhood uh, right there. So, you know, that they could remember. So, Yes, and if you if you reach those agreements, it's important to remember it is. And if you do, even if you're getting along famously well, right? Even if everything's hunky dory, please put it in writing between you both, just so if things go bad later on, you've got that reference. And if you've never re- recorded, written down things and got a definite plan, then every year you're wondering, oh, am I going to get the kids for Mother's Day? Um, Whose turn is it for Easter? Will they honour that agreement? You know, so it's worth getting that down, even if you just write it down and sign it. It's a parenting plan, but it's there. Mum, I think it's important maybe we just quickly touch on the divorce course personality prism that Mm. we can talk you through. Uh, You can listen to episode one if you don't know what divorce course personality you're in. Mm. Um, But I guess amicable when it comes to the agreement and children and parenting, like you've said, as long as you get it written down while you're amicable, yep. things should be okay. Yes, yes. You don't yep. need to go and to court you, to get yeah. orders for that. Just write them down and sign them and it's a parenting plan. Uh, yep. And then if anyone goes to court, you yep. show that parenting plan to the judge and go, well, this is what we've been doing. You know, why would we change this? Mm. Mm. Yeah. Then you've got uh, avoidant. So mm-hmm. they're the people that are like, oh, I don't want to even look at it I don't even want to notice that we've separated with those people um how does that work in this space of children and the court and I think I think you're going to need to set up your boundaries um if an avoidant person uh if if the other person's avoidant um then they're going to want to be able to take the kids um drop in um, and continue as though nothing's ever changed you know, so they need to be kind of corralled and, and you need to do everything to get it in writing and make it easy for them to just go, oh, yeah, that looks fair, go and see someone, sign it, give it back. So with an avoidant person, even if they won't agree, you need to set out in writing from your point of view, uh, you know, dear, yeah. whatever, dear John, you know, we've separated. Um, I, th- I think it's good if the kids come to you on 
this day, that day, that's what we've been doing for the last couple of weeks. Are you happy with that? You know, can you take Cindy to ballet? That sort of stuff. And just document mm. it, even if it's not signed by both parties. At least you've got a record. And and as a, a tip, I would say, instead of saying, what do you think? Or, you know, can you get back to me? Just say, look, unless I hear from you, um, I'll assume that this is all okay. And that sort of nails the avoidant person down. Then they don't have to do anything at all and it's just done. Yes. And I guess it's important to note here that you can have two different types of parenting agreements because right at the beginning when you separate, everything is all over the shop. So there are two types, aren't there? Mm. There's interim, which means in the meantime until we agree, and then there's the final. Yeah. So is that something people can do without the court as well, have have short-term? Yeah arrangements until they've got the full term yes that's right that and the court like you say talks about interim and final but I reckon there's also the micro orders so that the the ones in those first couple of weeks when when someone said well that's it we're separating um and yet the next morning the kids have got to go to school someone's got to take them to ballet or karate or whatever and you will gradually probably have already set up a little arrangement where you're probably seeing a little bit too much of each other, to be honest, um, and the kids are, you know, mm-hmm. seeing both of you quite regularly. And that's that's the, that's the what happens when no one's thinking about it. It's just kind of the natural thing after you first separate. And that usually goes for a couple of weeks or a couple of months till you get sorted into your interim orders. So, okay. Hmm. Okay. What about high conflict? So people that are like always wanting to fight about Mm. the colour of the chair or the colour of the sky, Mm. um, those high conflict people, when it comes to children, the court, the law, parenting agreements, um, any tips for anyone with a high conflict (sighs) divorce situation? Keep calm. <laughs> Keep calm. Um, they, they'll, they'll argue everything. So a couple of tips um, I would say is uh, try to let them think the things that are happening are their idea. Um, if you want to avoid fighting, you've probably been giving in to them throughout your relationship. Um, it may pay you to give in on a couple of points just to save the argument. Uh, balance the... the um, the pain to you of agreeing with them yet again when they've always been so bossy and argumentative, um, the pain that you feel with whether it really matters to your children. And and if you use the children as the benchmark, swallow your pride and give in to them one more time, it will reduce the number of arguments you have to have. So you need, really need to pick your battles. Um, and it's common once you get out of a relationship with a high conflict person that you feel so tremendously relieved. But every time then that they display their old con- high conflict behaviours, uh, you feel like um, standing up for yourself. Um, and that can yeah. be counterproductive. So just check against whether you're doing that for your own good, for your own mental health and strength, or is it really best for the children? And make a conscious decision about that. Really reality check yourself and make the choice that's better for the children. Mm -hmm. No matter how it makes you feel, you can go and get counselling. And then I guess that takes, I think, a little bit, a little bit to the uh, manipulative and controlling, I guess, this domestic violence situations or mm. or just people that are just really manipulative, mm. um, perhaps maybe like that person who said to them, if you don't agree to everything, you know, yes. <laughs> in my mediation. <laughs> um, so what do you say to people who are in it, like the, the that kind of really horrible um, divorce, you know, maybe mm. there's been domestic violence, that sort of thing when it comes to children and parenting and the court. Mm. Okay. So the thing with a manipulative and controlling um, ex-partner is you need to pay a real lot of attention to what happens in those first two days and first few weeks, that micro period, micro time, uh, because mm. A manip- manipulative person will be planning ahead all the time. You know, you know they are, and they will be positioning themselves to be able to say to a court, well, I've had the children, you know, 80% of the time since we separated, and you might not have even noticed. Uh, you know, they'll just uh, manoeuvre to have them, and then they will be putting to the court that perhaps that's 
better that the kids then live with him or her. You know, you just got to watch them. Um, you, you'll be genuinely grieving the end of the relationship um, and they will already be planning. Um, so just, again, double check with the partner, but start as you mean to go on with the manipulative person. So if your dad, for instance, and the children haven't, you're not getting the kids because mum says they're sick or or they, they've got things on or they've got a party to go to, um, just, just put your foot down with that and say, look, well, I can take him to the party. Uh, I can take her to the doctor. She can be sick at my house. And just make sure you put those boundaries and, and assertions in early. Yeah. 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 I guess that's hard. Um, that's, that's probably the hardest one I think. And that's mm. where I, I, I would say get, you know, make sure you're getting some support, some psychological, um, counseling, et cetera mm. as well. And also if you, if you have left a domestic violence situation, those first few weeks are a danger zone as well. Yes. So you can call 1-800-RESPECT, you can call, you know, DV Connect and they can help you. They can talk you through how to be extra vigilant or what to look out for um, and set you up so that you know that you're going to be okay for those that first tricky transitional period. Mm. Don't, don't believe what they say. A bit manipulative and controlling people yeah. will often say, oh, don't you don't need to talk to a lawyer. Rubbish, you talk to a lawyer. <laughs> there are lawyers to talk to for free. Don't, just don't get all of your information from a person who doesn't have your best interests at heart, and that is your manipulative and controlling yeah. ex. I guess if anyone's interested, there's the Mediation Podcast, there's the 12 Agreements for Parenting podcast episode. Um, go and listen to those. I'll put them in the show notes. Mm. If you're also interested, we're doing a free webinar coming up in September in 2020. Are we 2021? <laughs> 2021. I hope it's um, this so year. To this past that. I'm sorry. I'm coming <laughs> to your place. Uh, so uh, you, you can click on the show, no- <laughs> show notes and there's a link there to to go and register for the free webinar. We've only got a certain amount of spaces because we're new to this and yeah, it's our first we've one. got a lot of information to share, but we don't have enough space for everybody. So it's already half full. Um, it's on the five mistakes women make in divorce and how to avoid them. So mum's seen the pitfalls. She knows what people, mistakes that people make. And we're, tr- we're going to offer that free advice for you. So come along to our webinar. You get, you get to engage with us, see our faces and maybe learn something that can help you along your way in your divorce. But also we have been for the last uh, month, we said that if anyone had written us a review, we were going to choose from the reviews um, to get someone to speak to mum for free. And mum costs a lot of money to talk to normally, <laughs> except for all our lovely divorce course podcast listeners that get to, to mm. listen to her all the time. But mum is offering a free 30 minute chat. And so we have chosen some out of the beautiful reviews that we have received. Mm. And I thank you all from the bottom of our hearts for, for putting them through. Mm. I'm just going to read the review now. I'm not going to say your name but i would like you to email us at the divorce course podcast at gmail.com and i will be able to arrange the phone call with you and my beautiful mum so uh the person uh review that we're choosing said the title was brilliant resource this podcast is my absolute go-to navigating my own separation and also supporting my friends through theirs it's a perfect starting point to direct you exactly where you need to go next thank you so much for sharing this kiss kiss so oh. <laughs> thank you for that review absolutely love it don't you think Mum? i do nice i review? especially i especially love the kiss kiss <laughs> The kiss, kiss, and that she's helping other people. Yeah. Because every time you review, guys, that gives us an ability to reach more people because Apple and Spotify go, oh, the people like this review. So that's the getting mm. this free information out to help everyone. And hopefully this mm. episode has lowered your stress levels a little bit. If this is what you're going through, if you're stressing about the kids and stressing about you, maybe losing them, etc. Yeah. Uh, hopefully this has helped you. Um, so jump on, register for our free webinar. If this was you who wrote out the review, please please contact us at the divorce course podcast at gmail.com. And um, mm-hmm. if you would like to be in the running for a free chat with mum, 30 minute chat with mum next month, um, all you need to do is write us a review. <laughs> and of course, um, you know, we're not saying you have to give us a five star, uh, but it would be really nice if you could give us a review. Mum, was there any last words that you wanted to say? 
Yes, I just wanted to say that um, when I do, we do talk to when I do talk to this person, uh, it's in, absolutely confidential, so we won't use anything. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, it, it's, it's it's a proper it's not legal on the podcast. No, <laughs> but look, really, um, just know this: uh, yes. our family law system might not be perfect, but it's pretty good. I've worked in the system for thirty five years, and it helps. Uh, so many families through the breakups. So it, we're lucky we've got the framework we have. We're lucky we've got the court um, with its focus on mediation. So if you're about to go there, no one plans for it. No one walks down the aisle or gets lives with someone thinking they're going to get separated. But take comfort from the fact that anything that your ex-partner does or tries to do has been tried before many times and the court has systems to deal with it and your lawyer will have the skills um, to counter those things. So you'll get through this. Just hold on. A year of hard times, I call it, and then you'll be out. Mm. Hopefully. Okay. Sending everybody some love and we will speak to you next week. And if, and in the meantime, if you have any questions that you would like us to cover, please send them through. Um, you can message us through Instagram at the divorce course, um, on Instagram or the divorce course podcast on Facebook, or you can email us at the divorce course at G at divorce course podcast at gmail.com. Um, and I can always put your questions to mum in a way that it, you will know it's you. Um, but nobody else will know it's you and we can tailor an episode to cover, you know, basically Mm. the questions that you've asked and anything else. So it's, look, it's, it's, everybody should always get their independent legal advice. Okay. Because we never know what your situation Mm. is in total, but if that's right. And if someone's asked us a question and taken the time to write in, you can be pretty sure there are dozens and dozens of people who need to know the answer to that question. So that's why we use uh, these question and answer sessions at the end. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you for listening, everybody. And we look forward to seeing you at our webinar if you'd like to register and we look forward to reading your reviews. Have a lovely week. Bye, everyone. Bye, Laura. If you found this podcast helpful, we'd love it if you could rate, review and subscribe. By doing so, you are spreading the word to help someone else just like you. Lynn would like to remind you that this podcast is general advice only and you should always get legal advice in relation to your particular situation. And remember that the Australian laws may have changed since recording.